So this is the Marina Tree and Garden Club, and we're having hosting an event tonight. We're welcoming Eric Palmer of what used to be the Waste Management, uh, Monterey Regional Waste Management District, now rebranded as Regen. And we have uh, Neil Morrison from Green Waste Recovery. And they're here tonight to talk a little bit about SB 1383, which is a, a new state mandate and also a little bit about what goes where, uh, because we really are confused these days. Uh, before I hand the screens over, uh, I will wanted to talk about three events that are coming up. Uh, we do have two speakers lined up <clears throat> uh, for the next year. Uh, so October 20th, we have a presentation that will be in person, not Zoom, and it's on winter gardening, and it'll be with uh, Jeff Nilsson from Bouquet Nursery, and he'll uh, talk to us about why fall is such a good time to really get started in your garden and uh, some really good plants that uh, could be featured in your gardens. Uh, so keep your eyes uh, posted for uh, emails and uh, our website uh, and Facebook on that. Uh, January 19th, we will have a California Rare Fruit Growers uh, presentation and uh, Karen Anderson and Rob Weiskirk We'll both talk about uh, subtropical and tropical fruit growing in our region, which should be really fascinating. I do follow uh, their Facebook and uh, I have gone to some of their events and there's a lot of great knowledge and some really interesting plants. And I, hopefully they'll tell us more about how to do that. Um, and then October um, 16th, we have our, uh, our seed exchange at the farmer's market. So it's a great time to pick up all kinds of different plant material and if uh, your you gardeners out there, if you want to collect seeds uh, and bring them to share, do label them, put a date on them, uh, what you know about it, and uh, drop them off uh, from, we'll be there from 10 till 2, uh, but do bring everything before noon uh, so that we can find a home for everything. So that's coming up, and again, we'll uh, have notices for that as well. So uh, with no further ado, um, Eric and uh, Neil, I turn the screens over to you to give your presentation. <laughs> Great. Um, again, thank you very much for having us here. Uh, my name is Eric Palmer. I'm, um, let me share my screen. Um, can you all see it? Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I don't know where that, my title went, but. Um, my name is Eric. I'm the public education outreach coordinator at Regen Monterey, which is a new title that we've had for um, a couple of weeks now. Um, and um, Neil, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Of course. I'm Neil Morrison. I'm the environmental outreach coordinator with Green Waste Recovery. Great. Um, and um, so for our agenda here, uh, we want to have enough time for question and answers since I I, uh, I'm new to this job. I've been here for almost five months now. So um, I, I'm gonna do my best. This is actually my first presentation, um, which I'm really excited about. Uh, it's a good, a good mm -hmm. test to see my knowledge that I've learned from for about five months now. Um, and uh, so what uh, we kind of want to go through is, I just want to talk a little bit, very, very briefly about rebrand and the, the difference between um, our, what we do and what um, Neil's organization does, just because there's a lot of confusion, and that can help you when if you ever have questions in the future. And then we'll go into um, the new composting law um, and how you can help, and then um, a little bit about what what goes where. Um, so this is our previous logo, um, the Monterey Regional Waste Management District. Um, it's a mouthful. Uh, we have a seagull, which isn't exactly the best um, association with a landfill. Um, you know, it's, it's just a little bit outdated. Um, and uh, as I said, a mouthful. And sometimes when I'm saying my email address, I have to remember what the acronym is. Um, so uh, we decided to go with, uh, with this logo. So Regen Monterey. Um, and it's kind of a play on the words of the Monterey Regional. Um, but Regen, um, you know, has a lot to do with what we do. We don't want to be known as an organization that manages waste anymore. Um, even though our business model is um, collecting, you know, charging for tonnage that would go into the landfill, what what I really appreciate working for this organization, um, 
because I, I want to work somewhere fulfilling. And um, it's it's great that we have our new mission, which is we're reducing waste towards zero. So I don't know how the organization is going to, you know, be financially solvent in the future, but I really, I really like that mission um, as opposed to managing waste. We're helping the community reduce waste towards zero and this composting, new composting law is really going to make a huge difference, um, not only in our community, but in terms of climate change in the state and hopefully a lot of uh, other states and nations will follow. Uh, so anyway, um, this is kind of a, uh, you know, re re we regenerate resources. We collect your recyclables and we um, ship them off to manufacturers so they can remake new things. We regenerate um, the gases that come from the landfill. So we capture those gases and we turn it into electricity and electricity, that electricity powers our entire um, facility and, and more. We actually provide electricity to the grid. So we're regenerating in that way. Um, and then of course we are regenerating food waste um, and yard clipping waste into compost. So we felt like regen is simpler and it's more modern and the logo, as you can see, it's kind of has that like infinite circular economy in the green, you know, we're trying to move <coughs> greener you know, that's what the circles are. We're trying to move toward progress, toward a more uh, sustainable community. So I like it. And uh, I know it's kind of divisive. Uh, you know, a lot of people missed the old uh, logo and, and name, but um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm proud of it. Um, briefly, here's our boundaries. You know, we go from Moss Landing down to um, Big Sur. Um, we were located right outside of Marina. If you haven't been here, um, I'm sure many of you know it since you're in the community, but um, it's a great place to go to work. It's a great place to visit. Um, we have a recycling facility, a landfill, landfill to gas, household, we'll collect your household hazardous waste here. Um, and of course we have the famous last chance mercantile and um, all of the, um, of your waste from your, each of your uh, recycling, uh, each of your carts, um, come here and we process it. So that's what we do. Um, our pride and joy is our uh, material recovery facility. It processes all your recyclable, all the recyclables that are collected from the member agencies. Uh, we receive 250 tons of recycling a day from your blue bin recycling carts and it's sorted using technology and staff. Um, it's dropped into a um, what we call a tipping floor. Uh, the, garbage trucks come in, they drop it, and then we it's dumped into a complex system, as you can see in the photos of um, assembly lines, um, which are manned by lots of people. And it goes through, um, and they're hand picking out the contaminants, the stuff that people just don't care, and they just throw it in the recycling bin. Um, and that's why it's, we'll get into later why certain things, it's so important that you put in the right items because it can, there's people out there that are working so hard to pick that stuff out. We have technology that uses optical sorters, infrared lights and air jets that um, sort things by weight and the uh, infrared lights can identify certain things. So, and then we have people that when the technology doesn't pick it up, they're sorting it out and they work so hard. Uh, so that's why it's really, really important to recycle correctly because these, these people are working so, so hard um, and that, those items at the end of the day are bailed into, um, they're bailed uh, and they're sent to manufacturers. And um, what we also collect here, what we also sort here is construction and demolition items like lumber and scrap metal. And um, also there's a commercial recycling stream, which is mostly made up of cardboard, um, but it's a really, really impressive facility. Um, and uh, we have a video on, on our website if you ever want to see it in action. It's very, very cool. I, love visiting at any chance I get. Um, and we'll get into this more with the, um, the new composting law, but we have a section of our facility that does wind, what's called wind row composting. And there's separate, there's different ways that you can um, do composting, but we do what's called wind rows, which is basically uh, you see that um, uh, equipment there, it grinds up your yard waste and your food waste, and we put them in uh, piles. And um, 
basically um, the windrow process uh, involves grinding up all that material that comes in your green bin and um, it sits in these these piles and they sit there for 90 to 120 days they get really hot inside uh, up to 140 degrees in the middle of the in the rows and what's that that does is destroy pathogens and destroys weed seeds um, and creates this really nutrient rich soil that um, we sell uh, mainly to agricultural uh, businesses. Um, and then the, we're gonna get into why it's really important to um, put the right materials in your green bin because you'll see that um, we wanna create a really pure quality product um, because uh, our agricultural industry um, really relies on having this nutrient rich soil that doesn't have contaminants. Um, so yeah, moisture is added and these um, compost piles are tur uh, turned with special equipment constantly so that that, um, that heat can be dispersed um, evenly um, and it speeds up that decomposition process. And then of course, I'm sure many of you are aware of the last chance mercantile and this is like a model all throughout the country actually, um, and people can drop off uh, items that can be sellable. So just another way that we can um, divert, uh, especially large bulky items from the landfill. Uh, so it's not only donations, but people sometimes take stuff out to um, the other parts of our facility and we're able, if it's sellable um, and in good quality, um, we can take it to the last chance. And what's great is this has actually been taken over by the Veterans Transition Center. And um, we used to run it, but uh, we lease it to them. And uh, as an added bonus, it's um, uh, proceeds from this, this operation benefits homeless veterans. Um, and it's kind of like a job, um, a job training um, program for veteran, homeless veterans so that they can get some jobs on their resume. So I just think it's so wonderful. Um, it's just a wonderful place and I'm sure many of you have gone there. I know I have. Um, so yeah, I wanted to, um, so that's what the, mon the regen, mon uh, regen does, but I kind of wanted to um, have Neil explain the difference between um, what green waste does and what we do. Of course. So um, he just explained to you what regen does. I'm gonna go ahead and make, um, let you know what green waste recovery is all about. So green waste uh, recovery is the hauling side of um, this process. Um, we, green waste has provided trash recycling and organics collection for seven peninsula cities since July, 2015. We collect the material from your containers and we haul it to the processor, which is Regen. Um, we are basically your hauling side and your collection side. We do collections for residential, um, multifamily dwellings, and commercial. Great. Yeah, so if you ever have, we get a lot of questions about, you know, can I get a, a green bin or how come you haven't picked it up, um, you know, or have a mattress that I need to be picked up, things like that. Um, so, uh, it's really confusing to a lot of residents about um, the hauler, and I'm learning about this stuff too, you know, the hauler and the receiver. And we're a government agency, um, Green Waste is a private company, um, but uh, we're a government agency, which I think is great because we have, uh, not that Green Waste doesn't, but like that we have an interest in um, helping create a sustainable community um, and we're represented by your elected officials. Um, so yeah, here let's start diving into this new law, SB 1383. Um, Neil, did you want to speak to this? Yeah, of course. So SB 1383 is uh, it was a Senate or it is a Senate bill that um, got passed, um, and basically what that means is on from our side, from our perspective, um, we need everybody to, um, we're trying to get everybody in compliance with this new California law 
that requires everyone to start um, using organics um, collection carts. So the green carts um, that includes businesses, um, that includes food businesses, offices, um, that includes uh, multifamily dwellings, apartments, and residential, but residential has been doing that for some time already in some locations. Um, so that's what SB 1383 um, requires. Um, what I've been doing and what other outreach coordinators have been doing is um, we have been going out and we've been reviewing businesses and multifamily dwellings in many of the cities in Monterey County. Um, when we report these reviews, um, we report them to the site supervisors um, for the locations that we do the reviews on. And um, we tell them about SB 1383 um, being the new um, organics law. And um, we educate them on the need to separate their organics from their trash. Yeah, and it's basically, it's aimed at reducing methane emissions. That's the big goal of this because um, when food goes to the landfill, it creates methane gas, which is one of the most devastating and destructive uh, climate, uh, I mean, greenhouse gases. Um, so this is gonna take away so much uh, methane emissions from our state because um, I'll show you some slides about how much um, food makes up our landfill. So it's an easy way to extend the life of our landfill and to reduce that those carbon emissions and then on top of it, it's a valuable product. Instead of putting it in the landfill, we can create compost that um, can be used by local farms in our local cities. Um, and the law has started on January 1st. Um, and they're, the state's giving everybody two years to learn because it is a big learning, uh, learning curve. And that's why you know they hired people like me and Neil to get out there in the community and explain to people um, how this works. And there's lots of questions. And then enforcement is gonna begin in 2024. And by enforcement, that means um, they will act, we'll actually be doing audits, um, which require uh, what's called lid flipping. Um, they will, will have um, routes, we'll do lid flipping, we'll look in, in uh, people's lids, you know, just get a quick glance and see if people are complying. If uh, I'm not sure what the consequences will be yet, but um, that's uh, that's a way of really making sure this program works. Uh, instead of you know, instead of just the honor system, it's you know, making looking in bins and making sure that this is this is happening. So by 2024, um, we need to get our act together. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so Neil, did you want to continue? Yeah, and I'll go ahead and um, speak a little bit about this. So, um, so we have components of um, SB 1383. So when we offer our services to site supervisors, we give them the choices of self-hauling their organics to food and rescue uh, and donation services and or to subscribe to our very reasonably priced organic collection service. If they choose to donate, then the food can help those in need. And if they go with organic collection, then the food will be turned into composting at our Windrow, or not our Windrow facility, but Regen's Windrow facility. Yeah, so basically um, part of the law is if food can be eaten by businesses, um, then it, there's a requirement that that needs to be saved. Um, so we're working with food banks to um, collect that food. So this will be you know, cafeterias, schools, restaurants, grocery stores. So instead of, you know, you know how like expiration dates work, a lot of them are, um, are wrong, you know, and this food is still edible. So um, we will be uh, co collecting, we're working on collecting a lot of this food for food banks. So that's, that's the side that, you know, residents don't have to worry about so much, but, uh, you mm -hmm. know, here in the middle, we have organics collection and that's where we're 
asking that's the other side of it um which is obviously a big generator of food waste is households and that's what the your green bin um your green carts will be for so that there's that there's those two elements and this next slide will kind of show you the california waste diversion goals um so like uh the the second the the, the last two parts you know we want they want a 75 percent reduction in the disposal of organic waste by 2025 and then um the currently disposed edible food that can be recovered for human consumption needs to be um diverted by 20 percent. so these are big numbers and i think um it'll be great because as you can see here uh you know food insecurity is really high you know food as with inflation food is get it's even more important with inflation and how expensive food is getting so it'll be great that all our uh, food banks will be able to collect a lot more food and have more food donations. Um, Californians throw away more than 6 million food waste a year. And, um, and as you could see by our waste stream, look how much can be recovered. You know, there's food makes up, you know, 18%, um, you know, paper could be recycled, other organics, um lumber like look at that pie chart that can all be diverted from the landfill and turned into a precious compost resource instead of going to the landfill and landfills cannot be built anymore in california we have you know we have the landfills are uh somewhat relatively near capacity in the salinas valley um we have a, a, over a hundred years but um after that you know after that, who knows what we can do. So we don't want stuff going to landfill. We want these resources. I think it's such a great law. Um, May I uh, say something real yes, quick? Yes, please. So um, just to iterate the importance of having businesses, especially food businesses, donate their leftover food to donation centers. Um, it's, for instance, when I've gone out into the field to um, do reviews, I've noticed that some restaurants uh, will throw away entire like four yard bins full of like fresh food that just didn't get used for the day and they didn't want to let it sit or expire or give it away to be put in a refrigerator. So they just put it in a four yard bin. I've seen entire four yard bins filled with with fresh bread or entire four yard bins filled with uh, fresh food from another bakery or like um, another restaurant. So it is definitely something that we could work on um, as a, a state and as a community. And uh, to add to that, you know, we're starting with school programs and you'll, you'll see um, a lot of packaged food, you know, which is wasteful. Um, but then when the kids for example, they are forced to get a bag of carrots or a bag of apples or a bagged sandwich, and some of them don't want to eat them. Um, so instead of throwing them away or even dumping them in the um, comp in their green carts, um, we'll be able to save that packaged food and um, you know use them another day or um, or donate them. So I think that's another really important part of this law. Food scrap collection at home. I don't know, Neil, do you wanna take this one? Yeah, um, of course. So as you can see from the flyer that we have on the screen there, these are just some things that can be put in your um, small pail um, inside, um, which if you haven't heard, um, a lot of people are getting pails from the city or just buying their own pails uh, to put inside alongside their recycle trap or their recycle bin and their trash bin inside so they can separate from the source their food from their trash from their recycle. And um, I personally do this as well. So I have an organics pail that I put like my, you know, banana pills. Um, potato peelings, um, cooked meats um, that I can't finish, all of that goes in my pail, and then it gets put in a green cart, which then gets composted, 
So all the things that we would like to be compost are listed under the yes um, symbol or emblem up there. Um, as you can see, we have cooked fish, cooked chicken. We have some eggshells. We have um, coffee grounds, fruits, vegetables, beans, all sorts of stuff there. Um, and you can also even put um, yard trimmings in your green card. Um, but we definitely want to um, emphasize what can't go in the green card, which is like plastic films, styrofoam, twist ties, stickers, um, paper towels. Uh, we are no longer accepting compostable wear in the green carts. Um, we glass should definitely be going in the recycle and then raw meat. We don't want raw meat in the green carts because it can contaminate the rest of the, the organics that are in the green cart. Um, and then we definitely don't want any plastics or liquids in the organics carts. Those can also contaminate um, the source. And what I do is I have a, a kitchen scrap pail on my um, countertop. And then I also have um, in a, my trash closet, I'll call it, um, you know, I have a trash can, a recycle can, and another bigger uh, food scrap can. Um, I have six people in my house. So lots of kids, you know, lots of kids, we generate a good amount of food waste. Um, so, um, and that's, that's been plenty. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, so it's, I, I, I recommend having some kind of station. And I think as a society, we're just going to get used to having three different bins. And hopefully we start, you know, when you go to, um, you know, your work or different places, um, you, you'll see a recycle bin and a trash bin, but hopefully in time, you'll start to see green compostable bins um, at events and like um, workplaces and things like that. Um, so yeah, you can, you can use a, there's a picture of some kind of a pail that you could purchase or you can use a Folgers can, you could use whatever. So yeah, and this is just kind of like a, um, a diagram of what this system looks like. Um, you know, it's recycled, you collect it in your green bin, it's picked up, we turn it into compost, oops. Um, it's beneficially reused as compost and then it's consumed into food. And it's just that circular, zero waste um, mission that we are trying to do as a community and that the state is trying to do. Um, we also wanted to just show you some pictures of why we don't want that biodegradable bags or compostable foodware. And that's the biggest question that we get. And that's the biggest criticism that we get. Um, so I think it's really impactful to show people why we don't want those things. Um, you'll, these are pictures of the first top two um, is the commercial stream and we are uh, originally allowing and we still are because we we used to have technology that can break this stuff down but the windrow composting process does not break down biodegradable bags and compostable food wear. Um, it's kind of what we call greenwashing I think you've heard. Um, it, this is what it looks like. It's trash. And on the bottom left photo, you can see we have staff that are out there picking it out all day long. Um, so it's very, very important that, and we really, really don't want that material. It says compostable, but again, it's this, these issues with the manufacturers. They, you know, and same as when they tell us that things are recyclable and when they're really not. Um, and it, I wanted to show you what a pure compost pile looks like on the bottom right, which is pure food and yard trimmings that creates this product. So when the, our biggest customer, which is our agricultural customers come, uh, especially strawberries, uh, leafy greens, that the, their food touches the compost, they touch the soil, they want, they don't want, and, and if they want it to be um, certified as organic, it can't have even traces of, of this trash. And we, what we do is we pick it out as best as we can, we grind it up, but there's still little bits of trash in it, um, even though it's compostable. Um, and uh, that will um, deny 
a agricultural company from saying that their crop is organic. And a lot of our customers want to be organic. We want pure food and yard waste only. So please drop your food waste uh, without a bag directly into your green bin. We ask the same with recyclables. We don't want food, we don't want plastic, uh, your recyclables being uh, put in a plastic bag. Plastic bags are not recyclable. It causes a lot of complications. As you can see, we just have lots of staff that are pulling out plastic bags, even if they're compostable from our compost, from our compost set air, uh, area and from our recycling facility. It's very, very labor intensive and unnecessary if we can all just get together and um, do this properly. Uh, Neil, do you want to take this, this section? Of course. Um, so um, like you was saying in the previous slide, um, as you can see with the green cart, um, those are all things that we would like to go in the um, green cart. However, I do see a set of cup in the middle there. I think those are eggs. That's what I thought. Maybe those are like, but I'm not sure what the brown is. Okay. Well, if it's a cup, no cups. Yeah. But if that's an egg, yes. Eggshell is good. Um, we do want uh, any raw foods, yard trimmings, anything of the sort. Um, those, all those things are great. So we just want only cooked meats, uh, raw food, or not, no um, raw meats, but we do want cooked meats are fine. Um, any veggies, um, anything like that, no plastics, no oil, no plastic bags, um, no, no cardboard. Um, you can also put yard trimmings in the green carts. Um, and then if we move over to the blue cart, um, those are all things that can be recycled. Um, this is just something that I think that people are, are relatively accustomed to now. So you can see the metals and the plastics. Um, hopefully, I don't know if everyone knows, but the plastics that you can put in the recycling are one, fives, and sevens, if I'm not mistaken. One, two, and five. One, twos, and fives, not one, fives. One, twos, and fives are the little triangles on the bottoms of our plastics. Um, and they're labeled with a little number in the middle. And it's either a one, uh, a two, or a five. And those can be recycled um, and put into our blue bins and blue carts. Um, what we want in the gray carts or bins um, or black carts or black bins um, are those items which are shown there. Um, things that are um, too covered in grease or food, um, instead of recycling those, we prefer those going to trash. And then um, any uh, styrofoam plates, cups, um, those uh, styrofoam popcorn things that are in our packaging, definitely in the trash, um, hoses of any kind, thin plastic film, um, and um, some other types of plastic. So those are all things, oh, and black plastic uh, can all go in the trash. I think that's where a lot of the confusion is with plastic, um, is you know, it's that other example of greenwashing that I was talking about. They have these recycle symbols on all these, all, you know, there's seven of them on plastic products. So you, I know before I worked for uh, this agency, um, I thought they were all recyclable. I thought anything with a recycle symbol on it meant it was recyclable, but it's just not the case. It's all based on the market and who will purchase these materials once we put them in bales. And right now, one, two, and five are the ones that people that manufacturers want to purchase. Um, and so it's just really too bad that they have to have those symbols on every other ki kind of plastic because uh, it just ends up, it's trash. Um, and um, again, I'd really like to emphasize that we do not want film plastic in the recycle bin because um, our, uh, recycle facility is just this complex maze of assembly lines and gears and um, what has to happen is anytime those plastic bags come through there it gets caught up in the gears everything has to stop and 
it's dangerous work. People have to crawl into these, uh, onto the gears and into the machinery to pull this stuff out, pull out the plastic. So we ask that food and yard waste is put loosely into your green bin, recyclables are put loosely into your recycle bin, and your trash, it is actually best to bag those, those items. Um, uh, so, so that's, um, this is kind of a, you know, food containers are typically, are, are typically great. Um, most paper, mixed paper items, um, um, that's kind of what goes in recycling. And if you ever have questions, um, and this is how I've learned a lot at my job, is we have an app called What Goes Where that you can download. Um, and if you don't feel like downloading an, an app, we also have it on our website at regenmonterey.org on the homepage and you can go there and you, uh, people call me all the time and they'll be like, oh, um, can I, where does my microwave go? Um, and you just go right on the app and type in microwave and it'll give you instructions on exactly where to put it. So this is such a great tool and it's very popular. So if you ever, ever have questions about what to do with something, um, you can start there. And then um, if that doesn't work, we, you're welcome to um, email us at any time. Um, we answer these questions all day long. Uh, Neil's um, custom, Green Waste customer service phone number is listed here, um, but feel free anytime to email us um, if you ever have any questions about what goes where or any kind of clarifying questions. And of course, um, we'd love to hear your questions. And again, I want to emphasize that I'm new here, so I going to do my best, you know, we'll do our best to answer your questions. Um, but uh, I'm fairly confident that that we could do it. So that's about it for our presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> do you want to bring your uh, screen down? Oh, how do I do that? Uh, I'm talking to Eric and Neil. Here we go. Any questions? I know I have a few. I have a one comment. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, I've, if you have um, styrofoam, what do they call them? Uh, peanuts. Uh, I know that the FedEx here in Marina will take them. They will also take some of those uh, those plastic things that have been blown up and used. They will take a, a lot of that stuff if it's clean and good and you just bring it in and show it to them. I, I don't know about any other shipping company, but FedEx will take it. So one, one less thing into the landfill. That's great. I didn't. I didn't know that. Of course, if everybody does it, <laughs> it might be different. But I do it. <laughs> and Carrie, are you speaking about the um, the place that's next to Bagel Donut? Yeah, the it used to be the mailboxes place, mm -hmm. and now it's FedEx. Great. So, yeah. So uh, they've they've there are certain things that they won't take, but it been a relief to have them take some of those. Uh, if you bring in the peanuts, bring them in with a bag. I, I'm just going to say this out loud, uh, even though Eric answered it, there was a question about uh, recycling <coughs> hoses, and there currently is no way to um, recycle an old hose unless you find another gardener or somebody that just needs a section of old hose. Um, I just wanted to get that on the record. Um, it looks like Tina has a question too about shredded paper. Do you put it in a plastic bag or not? No, no plastic. Well, you can put it in a plastic bag, take it to the recycling and dump it out of the plastic bag in there. And then you can put the plastic bag in a trash can. And you're, you're speaking of the, the trash cans that people have by their house. Correct. Okay. I had a question. When's the next open house for the MRF? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, uh, 
tours or something, you know, of course I'm learning the ropes here and learning about the facility and everything. And we're, uh, we've done very minimal tours. Um, but that's something that we talk about all the time when we're going to do that. We just need to be confident in our knowledge and uh, safety practices. I've, yeah, I've only been there for a few months and our most of our team is new. Um, so I don't, I don't think it'll, it'll, I don't think it'll be soon, but toward the end of the year. And if we need, we want to hear from people that that's what they want. So, um, <clears throat> so it's good to, good, good, good to get that feedback that uh, people would appreciate that. I know everyone I've talked to that went to the last tour was really impressed. So it's put impressive. It in, put it in your cap there. Okay, I will. So to answer the question about why cooked meats versus non-cooked meats, uh, non-cooked meats can um, contaminate the rest of the organics with different um, either viruses or bacteria um, that, or even parasites or anything that's in the meat can get into the rest of everything else and contaminate everything else. Rather, uh, and if you cook the meat, cooked meat, it, it kills off viruses, bacteria, and um, anything else that may be in the raw meat. When you cook it, there's nothing bad left in there. So when you throw it away, it's you're not going to contaminate the rest of the material. And then uh, Dana asked if uh, we are going to offer worm bins for sale. And that's, that's another um, program that we had going for a while. And um, because, again, because we have new staff, um, that's a program we're discussing about when we would start doing that again. Unfortunately, uh, the person who I'm taking over from, uh, maybe you all remember her, Kimberly Herring, uh, who is awesome. Uh, she was a worm composting expert. So uh, she, that was her passion. She does it at home. So she brought that skill set with her. I don't have that um, skill set. I come more, from more of a, a digital communications uh, background. Um, so, you know, she had that passion and, um, but we do get a lot of questions about um, those presentations and offering those. So um, we're listening and um, it is definitely something uh, that we're considering strongly. Uh, Karen, did you have a question? Thanks, Eric. Um, two comments. One is regarding film plastic. Uh, it's long been the case that we can bag up our film plastic and take it to a drop box right in front of the Lucky Store here in town. And I just did that today. And then um, I noticed there's a similar con um, receptacle for that uh, at the Target now and i think what they're doing is that their pallets come wrapped in film plastic and so they have a recycling stream and they let us join in with that with our you know plastic bags and, and things that uh, are like that and then the second comment was um perhaps you'd like to go into a little detail about how much value added to your compost you um the facility does to send out um product compost products to all the farms who want it. It's, it's, it was a really impressive tour I had out there. Do you yeah. know it? I, I can answer it if you don't. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, please. So, um, so after the compost is finished, the 90 to 120 days, um, for starters, we're going to start having a ton of this, tons and tons of this compost. So, um, the, the facility is able to make custom blends by adding gypsum and something else I don't remember um, and delivering and spreading it to um, vineyards and farms all around the area. So I was really impressed when I came out for a tour of the compost facility. So thanks. Let's see. I see a couple of more questions in the uh, chat uh, that um, maybe you could address. Yeah, how to dispose of cooking grease and oil. Um, I do you, Neil, do you know the answer to that? I'm, um, I'm looking it up on what goes where right now, and I'm trying to find a good answer for that. Yeah, I think um, what my understanding is, is that, you know, obviously you do not want to put it down any drains because that has a major effect on our 
our very aging um, sewer system because it can cause these blockages. Um, so it's my understanding now that I remember from working at the city of Monterey um, after I came here that we would encourage people to, um, you know, put it in like a, a tin can um, and let it solidify and then it, you put it in the garbage. Um, I'm not speak, speaking with total authority here, but um, that is what I uh, recall um, communicating to the public. And that's what I do. Um, so what, I believe I found the answer to that. So um, most of the answers that I, I have found here and including one from our, our own um, mailed out letters is um, it's considered a household hazardous waste and um, you can actually like keep it in, you can put it back into a bottle or a container and then um, you can either put it, I believe curbside for it to be picked up or you can drop it off in one of our drop off locations during our hours of operation. That's wonderful, thanks, that's great. Um, what manufacturers take their recycled bales? Um, so I don't know specifically, but um, we found a lot of, uh, what happened is it used to be sent to China and um, Americans did such an awful job at recycling and um, we didn't sort them well in terms of re removing contaminants that uh, they no longer wanted to take it. Because I think what was happening is we weren't really sorting it correctly. People weren't disposing of recyclables correctly and they're just getting a lot of trash um, and they got tired of it and I don't blame them. Um, so there's a lot more stringent requirements in terms of the bales that we create. And I believe it has to be like 99% pure uh, material of whatever it is. Um, but luckily we have found uh, domestic um, manufacturers that uh, collect certain kinds of products. So there's, um, you know, certain companies that collect baled cardboard, which is very, very valuable, obviously with um, the pandemic um, creating a lot of demand for deliveries. Um, and then, you know, glass, um, aluminum, you know, um, all those different kinds of products. Uh, um, I don't have, I don't know exactly where um, I on me at, at this moment, I do have a chart, uh, but they, they go to domestic, we found domestic markets um, that will accept these recycled materials. And to touch on, I'm oh, sorry for interrupting, um, to touch on the, uh, um, whether or not we will have somebody going out to speak to people um, about the, this new law, um, that's what my position is for. I'm an outreach coordinator and um, they send me out to all the community events all, uh, all year long to go and speak to the general public about um, what goes where and how to separate things properly. So I've already um, done the Marina um, Earth Day. I've done the Seaside Earth Day. Um, and I have like four or five different events coming up, including um, National Night Out in August um, to talk to the general public about what goes where. Yeah, we go to a lot of, a big part of our job is to go um, to, um, is to go to uh, events and table and we get these same questions um, and there's long lines to ask us these, these kinds of questions. Um, so, you know, that's a big part of our strategy. It's not, we can't just do digital communications and getting newspaper articles and KSPW stories. You re, people consume information in different ways. So um, we're constantly strategizing how to uh, let people know about this stuff. And I know, um, I think Green Waste and we have, uh, we put out flyers in the mail. Um, um, so, these are great ideas. We, you know, we're always looking for ways to reach as many people as possible. And that's why the school programs are really important. We just hired a school coordinator. And um, if we can get to kids early, uh, I know when I was a kid, that was when recycling 
started. Um, and we had blue bins in our classrooms and we learned, I learned as a five or six year old that how to recycle. And I grew up to know how to recycle. Um, so if we can tell, if we can get kids used to um, knowing that there's a third waste bin and that they always throw their food away and why it's important, uh, we can get them started early. And as adults, they will be, they'll be ready. They might also come home and tell mom and dad how to do it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I know I'm still telling my mom and dad how to do it. <laughs> or tell their grandparents how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah, we'll look into the door to door. Um, yeah, the door to door stuff, you know, obviously staffing is a big issue, but um, there is service learning um, requirements at like CSUMB and other, you know, and uh, service, um, you know, people, you know, a lot of students have like some kind of service requirement. So that could be a good idea to, um, to consider for sure. Thank you. I had a question since uh, with having the reduction of methane uh, as a goal, how will Regen be powering um, on site um, or, you know, in the future as the methane is reduced? That's a big question of mine as well, actually. Um, and I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I, I was wondering that. I know we produce like an excess, um, an excess, the methane that we produce, there's an excess that we are able to sell. Um, but I think just the main, main priority is to reduce the amount of waste going in the landfill. So I think that's the main priority in um, uh, electricity generation uh, from these harmful gases that I don't know that that I can't speak I can't speak for uh, the directors the board of directors but um, anyway that's just my speculation I mean I'm but, sure we'll adopt um, other renewable resources to power our facility if need be uh, maybe folks don't know this but uh, regen is completely powers most of its equipment from the capture of uh, the methane on site. So it'd be a big loss for them because it, you know, it's a great savings. Um, okay. I had a quick question on a cardboard recycling. I know you said you had all those separator machines and I've read that you guys don't like labels on packaging. Is that true? Because I feel like every package that gets delivered has a postage label on it and no one I really know removes them and I don't know if I'm the only one sitting there peeling them off and if it makes a difference or I think if it has like plastic on it I would like maybe make an effort to remove okay. it but um, in terms of like even uh, plastic bottles and uh, your tin cans that have paper labels on them it's my understanding that that's okay, uh, okay. to keep those on there um, so most, la most labels are fine. Um, does that sound right, Neil? I believe so, yes. Yeah. Um, and then Cindy and Michael asked, um, please let people know where they can take their food waste when they do not have a green bin. So um, this will be a requirement, as I said, um, and uh, we are being given two years to comply. So if you, if you, if you don't own your home, if you live in like an apartment um, or you have a landlord, they will be required to give you a green bin. Um, unfortunately, some are dragging their feet a little bit um, and they are able to until um, 2024. Uh, but if you don't have a green bin, you can call um, Green Waste, uh, call Neil and request it. It is um, no additional charge. It's part of your uh, package. Um, so you can request it. And I recommend requesting it. If you have a landlord um, or a property manager at an apartment, ask them to uh, provide green bins for you. Um, and if they're kind of reluctant, um, they have that freedom, unfortunately, right now, but not for long. And they will be required soon. So Unfortunately, we do have to wait. And there has been talks about creating community drop-off centers. Um, 
but we need buy-in from cities uh, to um, have those collection centers. And as someone who worked for a city, I, I know that there will be some reluctance to do that uh, based on um, supervision to make sure, because for example, Pacific Grove had a drop-off center um, near the downtown. And what was happening is people were just dumping their trash in there. Uh, because they couldn't um, supervise it all the time. So um, they had food waste bins that people could drop off and uh, they just got so much trash, people just dumping trash inside of it. Um, so I think that's a major concern to a lot of cities. So uh, I don't know how much buy-in there will be from cities because they have those concerns. And of course, pests uh, like you know vermin and raccoons and things like that. Um, if we were to put it in like a park, for example. Um, so I would request first. Um, and then um, in the meantime, we are in having discussions about if there can be some food drop off locations. And Neil, they, um, they also asked if there's only one size for the green bin. I believe the answer is yes. Or the green cards for residential? Yeah. Um, that is a good question. I cannot speak on residential stuff because I mostly deal with the business side and the apartment side of things. But I think if I'm not mistaken, we offer a size up for a 95 gallon residential, but let me check on that real quick. Should have that here. I have a funny question. Um, <laughs> I um, have been composting out, you know, food for years and years and years. Um, and I will probably continue to compost my food, but I'm trying to envision um, the kind of stuff that I put in my compost bin is, you know, there's a lot of gooey, sticky, you know, stuff. And in the compost bin, it's fine. You know, I know how to layer it and I put, you know, water and I stir it all up and everything's great. If it goes into my green waste, it just seems like it's gonna make a huge sticky, yucky green waste bin. And I, we're just, we don't have that much food. If, I'm just thinking in terms of other people trying to use their green waste. If all they've got is two people like me and my husband, we don't have that much food waste in a week, but a lot of it's gooey. You put it in the green waste, it's in the bottom and it's sticking there for a week. You and then could, you're like. I was gonna say you could try using maybe flour or cornstarch to, to stop it from sticking because those things are naturally like absorbent or maybe even like, like if you have like rice that you're not going to use, whether that's like brown rice or something, you could use that as a liquid absorbent. Um, to absorb liquids at the bottom. Um, I've been using a little bit of flour at the bottom of my organics pails um, to keep it, the stuff from sticking to the bottom. So the other... paper wouldn't work in, you know, like the shredded, no? No. So, um, you know, that's, of course, I use that in the compost, but not yeah. with the wind row. That's a yeah, and that's a that's probably the number one question and concern of people is they really don't like their green bins getting dirty. That's I would say that's the number one thing I have to talk about. Um, and uh, there's a couple things you know you could. What I do is I I don't dump. I have a household full of six six people, um, so uh, I think we create a, a good amount of food waste. Um, and uh, I wait until the day, the night before or the day of uh, food of when the trucks come so that it's not just sitting out, outside for a week. Um, and I, for six people, we, I have enough storage that um, that's not a problem. Um, if you have a smaller amount of people, uh, I know a lot of people like to freeze it, um, keep it in the freezer, keep it in like a Ziploc bag in the freezer, and then you can drop it on drop it in there the night before the day of too. So that's a very common thing. And the other thing I do is I don't have much landscape, do much landscaping, I don't have time with all my children, but when I do do some yard work, I don't dump it in the yard waste right away. I have a pile on the side of my house 
And uh, that way I always have kind of a layer on the bottom um, and I don't put it all in there right away. So I, so I can make sure to have some yard waste on the bottom, but it is gonna be kind of gross. Um, there's not really much we could do to avoid it, but those are kind of some tips to make it not as bad. Yeah, I can imagine because I have a lot of green waste too. And if I were doing it, I would wait until I had some green waste. That's what I figured that I don't know that that's what people will do. Interesting that you get that comment a lot. A lot, yeah. People are very concerned about their bins being dirty. Um, and it's, it's my personal opinion, not my organization, but I'm just kind of like, it's a trash, it's a trash can. Uh, it's going to get dirty. It's, it is what it is. Um, it's not inside my house. It's outside of my house. It's fine that it's, it's dirty. And if it gets dirty enough, can I, uh, Neil, can I request a new one? You can request a swap or you can request a cleaning. Oh, okay. there you go. Um, and then Dana asked, are green bins free of charge? Um, and I want to say the answer is yes, right? The package that uh, I know I, in Monterey, Monterey Disposal, I get, you know, you have an option of having a, a, a green yard bin, but I'm paying for the three, I'm paying for the three carts. Is that the same in Marina, Neil? Um, no, I think if you're paying for the trash service, I believe the, I believe if you're paying for the trash and recycle, I believe the organics is complimentary, or if you're paying for the trash, the recycling and organics is complimentary. Okay. For, yeah. for residential. Residential, yes. Yeah. So no paper at all? Like if you put a piece of, like a butter wrapper or something in your food waste, that's not allowed? I mean, I just, we just ask if you do, you know, the best you can, you know, it's not always going to be perfect, um, but we want, we just want that pure product, as I said, and that butter wrapper is going to have to be picked out by somebody. It's not part of the composting. No, the, the, our process, uh, we, we had a machine for a while, like a, a pilot project that would heat it up, heat up, um, heat up this material to a point where it uh, could, but still didn't really work very effectively. Um, but when it's just sitting out there and in, in our foggy atmosphere, um, it's just not breaking down. It's not breaking down the paper and not breaking down. Yeah, it was the anaerobic digester. Exactly. That's what it was called. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and it just, it didn't create a product that was very good and it smelled bad and it, it just, uh, it, it, and that's, and that's why we, you saw, that's why the commercial um, stream piles still have it is because we had that that anaerobic digester um, but it just was very energy intensive and very odorous and um, it just didn't create that still didn't create that that product that we want that our customers want and in other in other, in other cities they they'll take the compostable um, materials uh, this is just unique to our region, but other places do accept it because a lot of their compost is going into city parks or um, and things like that where they don't really care about those little bits of paper and um, compostable items that maybe eventually over time will um, break down. But for us, agriculture and especially organic uh, farmers, they want they want that pure product. They don't they don't want the trash. Are you still selling the compost out there? Yep. To yep. those residents? Yep. Yeah. So this might be an obvious question. With so much contamination being part of the process, I mean, what, what kind of development is in place for really, um, you know, like restricting or redesigning some of these products or uh, reducing these, you know, more with the manufacturer level. What, what is there anything in the state that's working towards that? There is, um, and that's where the state is really, you know, needs to take the lead. We can't, as a little agency in Monterey County, we don't have very much influence to say, hey, plastic recyclers, stop doing this, or compostable material recyclers, stop doing this. They're, 
they're making their profits and they're going to continue doing what they're doing. Um, so we really rely on the state to create legislation and there is legislation that requires any kind of like, you know, organics is used pretty um, freely. Um, so when certain things aren't organic, right, you know, they just slap that label on it. So a lot of things are slapped with the label of being compostable or biodegradable. And sure, maybe they are, but you don't know how long it takes. It could be a week, it could be months, it could be years. And that's why I'll tell people still use compostable foodware in bags because it's going to the landfill, but unlike plastic, which will last for thousands of years, it will break down quicker. So it's still better, but it's not it's not compostable in our process. So um, there is legislation being proposed to make really strict standards for what's called compostable and that it actually composts in a reasonable amount of time and in the in in our kind of industrial processes and in at home. So um, we are involved in signing letters in support of those kinds of things. Um, but it's, it's up to our elected officials to um, require manufacturers to um, to make products that are actually recyclable or actually compostable. Is that something that citizens could support in some way? Is there a sure. way? Sure. Yeah. I mean, when these this legislation comes through, you know, you know, signing letters, and especially I think um, when it comes from groups, you know, like uh, associations like yourselves, um, you know, they collect these these letters for legislation, um, and um, the more they have, and the more you lobby your congressmen and um, things like that, that this is important, and uh, you know, it, it helps. Uh, and one thing you know, I'm thinking of is like, there's a right to repair bill, for example, because a lot of companies, for example, have make these cell phones that only last for a certain amount of years on purpose so that you'll buy more. So there's a law that's going through the process that uh, requires Apple to um, allow them to be um, repaired cheaply and not create new parts that won't be produced anymore. So uh, California really is on is progressive when it comes to um, challenging businesses and now challenging residents to recycle properly and create um, materials that uh, can be reused. I think we're I think we're making great steps. Any other questions out there? Okay, well. well I was gonna say one more thing. Um, just to wrap everything up, if you wanted any more information about SB 1383, um, the new law, you could always go to calrecycle.california or ca.gov to get more information about SB 1383. And feel free to um, reach out to us anytime too. Um, and uh, yeah, it was a great conversation. You guys had great questions and um, it was a good first presentation for me. And I appreciate the invite so much. Well, I'm really happy that you accepted. <laughs> I think more people need to hear this. It's just wonderful. And that's why we, I, we appreciate that we have two years uh, to, to do presentations like this. And we're getting more and more presentation requests and um, Tours are great to show people a composting operation. I love showing people the bagged area to show how gross and dirty it is. And we hide it in the corner because it's just, it's awful, um, you know, because people really insist on using the bags and they're trying to do the right thing by buying compostable foodware. But um, as I said, it's just another form of greenwashing. And, um, but that's what we're here for. We're, we're educators and, um, that's what we got hired to do is to help uh, create a sustainable community. So we appreciate groups like yours that care. And you guys will be advocates for us and be able to answer questions for others too. And that's the hope is we create this web of, uh, of knowledge. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. So if, um, if, if uh, there are no more questions, I guess we'll conclude, but um, 
really, this has been very useful information. I know so many conversations where we just have questions and no answers. So I'm very glad that you accepted. And um, I hope maybe we'll have another, have you back in a year and maybe things will have changed and uh, we'll just keep getting the word out there. Yeah, we're happy to do presentations anytime if you have questions about this kind of stuff or even to do this again. Um, but I guess you'll have it on YouTube too. So that's always good. Yes. But we will great. post it and we'll get, we'll put it up on uh, Facebook and let people know that may have missed the meeting tonight. Cool. We'll share it on our social media too. All right. Great. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Have thank a great you. Day, thank everyone. you. Bye. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye. Bye.